Thank you, guys. Amen. That was fantastic. You know, I didn't get a chance to touch base with uh, Dennis uh, Frost. You're having surgery tomorrow morning, aren't you? Can, can you help remind us when, when are you going in, where are you going to be in the surgery? About one o'clock, are they? Anything? At the service. At the service. Okay. Are they going to be doing your back? Is that what they're going to be? No. No? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, let's pray. We'll have, we talked about praying at 730 for, for uh, Gene and uh, praying for Dennis as well at one o'clock. You know, I love that, that song that they closed the worship package with, uh, the one that they said was a new song. And it wasn't super familiar to us, but it talked about coming to the altar. And uh, certainly as we turn our attention to the book of Revelation in chapter 4, uh, we're going to be taken to the altar of God. And we're going to be allowed to see uh, a future scene that we are, uh, hopefully, if we know Christ is our Lord and Savior, that we are very much going to be a part of. Uh, so if you haven't already, I ask you to open up your Bibles and turn to Revelation uh, chapter 4. Um, we just finished the seventh church last week of chapter 2 and 3. It dealt with the seven churches. Um, as we move on into chapter 4, though, we need to touch on some certain things that may come up. Um, first of all, uh, I need to remind you that Revelation is very symbolic. I mean, you may have heard some things described differently than I'm going to describe them. Um, you know, certainly we can always go to other scriptures and, and try to clear some things up, but, but some things we need to just accept that we are never going to know. Because the problem arises that John is using his own language, his own familiarity with some 2,000 years ago, and he's trying to describe things of the future, trying to describe things in heaven. I mean, think of it for, from 2,000 years ago. How, if he saw an airplane suddenly in his vision, or a tank, I mean, how would he describe it? What likeness would he have? Or even us today, if suddenly we were allowed to see a heavenly scene. I mean, what do we have on this side of eternity? You know, the, the taintedness of sin that is in our lives and in creation right now, that, that we could use to help describe and people understand heaven. Um, that's why some things are, are so difficult. So if you have ever heard something different, please lovingly come and share it with me, and I will lovingly correct your theology. Okay? So is that fair? <laughs> There's a lot of things I, I, I certainly do not understand, and, and we just hold on to and we accept that the glory that's before us. So with that in mind, um, let me remind you of the timetable that we were given way back in chapter 1. I'll put this verse up for you. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, remember what Christ says to, to, to John. He says, Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things that will take place after these things. Now we also, we, there's kind of three points that he has there. He talks about the things that you have seen. That dealt in chapter 1. He was giving us that vision that he had of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 2 and 3, he gave us the things that are. He talked about the very literal churches that we have been looking at for some seven weeks here. They were there existing. And then in chapters 4 through 19, he's going to be talk about the things that are hereafter, that are going to be coming after that. Um, so, so some other things to, to note as we move into chapter 4 here. Um, John, up until this point of, of the vision, he has been on earth. In chapters 1 through 3, he is actually still on the prison island of Patmos, and he's allowed to see this vision, and, and Christ dictates these letters to him to have them sent to the seven churches. But now as we enter into chapter 4 through chapter 22, John is no longer going to be in the island of Patmos, but his viewpoint is going to be from heaven. It says in verse 1 of chapter 4, he says, after these things, he's just talking about the vision that he had, the things that were, you know, the letters to the church. He said, after these things I looked, and behold, the door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. You know, uh, that, that, that picture of John suddenly after the church is the things that are suddenly now being taken in heaven, and we're going to be talking about future things. It's very picturesque. 
of what is going to happen with the church. And we talk about the rapture, that the church is going to be raptured. Believers in Jesus Christ are going to be taken to be with him just before the end times, these things that are written are going to take place. Now there's a lot of evidence for that, to, and there's a lot of debate in Christianity of when this happens, that the church is raptured and taken. I, I think we got some real clear evidence here, especially as you get into the book of Revelation, that the church, believers in Christ, are not going to go through the tribulation, but that we are going to be raptured, we are going to be taken up to be with Jesus Christ uh, during that time. Um, one, one of the, the, the clearest evidences of that, if you look at chapters 1, 2, 3, um, of, of this book, the word church is used close to 20 times. It speaks very freely about the church in the first three chapters. But the final 22 chapters, the word church is not used anymore. Once John is taken up into heaven, he's allowed to see the vision, and the tribulation is laid out before him, you're not going to read the word church again. Suddenly it goes back to the Old Testament economy and it starts talking about the Jews and it talks about Israel and it talks about Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, it even has the separation of the, the Jews and Gentiles. I mean, for the church, there is no Jew or Gentile. We are all one in Christ. But now as Revelation unfolds, he is back to the Jewish economy. We're going to see why in just a minute. Um, also, in the first three Chapters, you see that Christ says he is in the midst of the candlesticks. Those seven candlesticks, each representing the church. He is in the middle. Now as we get to chapter 4 on, Christ is not in the middle of the candlesticks, but he is in heaven. And the church is with him. Uh, there's other places of scripture uh, that give us an indication that the church is going to be taken. The believers are going to be raptured before the tribulation. Uh, I'll give a bunch of verses to you. 1 Thessalonians chapter not, uh, 1, verse 9 and 10. It says, for they themselves report about us what kind of a reception that we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the that is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. So very clear, they are waiting for Jesus who is going to rescue them from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. It says, for God has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the very scripture in 1 Thessalonians where we get the word rapture, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15, it says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died in Christ, we're not going to go before them. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, it's the word raptura there, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. We looked, uh, as we were looking at one of the churches, in the church of Philadelphia, in chapter 3, verse 10, Remember one of the promises for those who held faithful was that they would be kept from the hour of trial that was to come. And so promise after promise after promise, scripture seems to indicate that the church is going to no longer be here, that God, Christ, is going to be dealing with Israel. As a matter of fact, uh, you can kind of make a, a neat connection. A lot of commentaries did. Um, in that first Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, uh, that we just read a moment ago, it says, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That emphasis of that, that trumpet of God. Well, you see in verse 1, what does it say there? It says, after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open to heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet, speaking with me, come up here and I will show you what well, things must take place after these things. And many of the commentaries, you know, well make that connection between those of the same trumpets that happen before the tribulation comes, that we are taken up. This all seems to point to that this is the church, or excuse me, the place that the church is taken up. But I do want to emphasize to us that the rapture of the church is not what begins the tribulation. And we need to understand that. The rapture of the church 
is not what begins the tribulation. Um, I want you to go with me if you can. I'm going to turn there. I'm not going to put these verses on there um, because it's important. I want you to turn back to Daniel, if you will. Daniel chapter 9. I know I have uh, talked through Daniel before and I've talked through the, this timetable. And we're going to just briefly remind ourselves of that. But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. Okay, let's go ahead and turn there. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. If you remember, uh, at this point in the book of Daniel, uh, the Israelites were captive in, in Babylon. There was a 70-year captivity um, that basically was God had placed them in because of their disobedience. And they're coming to the end of that 70-year captivity. And Daniel's in prayer. He's in prayer for his people, the Jewish people, because quite honestly, uh, they're not ready. They're not ready to go back. But there were probably a, a couple million of them that were living in Babylon at this time. We know ultimately when they're released to go back, only 50,000 even want to go back. They've assimilated into the culture. So they're looking around and they're seeing their people. He's seeing his people. He says, we're, we're, not, we're not set apart. We're not the people that are living for you. And so he is praying, God, you know, we're coming towards the end of the seven years. It's coming. What's next? And what's going to happen? And in response to this, God gives him a, a, a timetable for us. It says in verse 24, it says 70 weeks, or literally it can be translated 70 units, has been decreed, decreed for your people in your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end to sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy place. So who you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, there will be 70 weeks, 7 weeks, and 62 weeks. It will be built again with the plaza and moat even in the times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war, desolation, and desolation are determined. And he will make a firm covenant with many for the final week, for the one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifices and grain offerings. And on the wings of abomination will come the one who makes desolate, even until the complete destruction of the one of the one that it is decreed is poured out on the one who has made desolate. So let's talk through a couple of things real quickly here. Um, Daniel is giving a, God has given Daniel a timetable here. And that timetable is upon Israel. It's about the Jewish people. It's about the city Jerusalem. It says in that verse 24, verse A, he says, uh, you know, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and for your holy city. So he's not talking about the church here. He's not talking about no Jew or Gentile anymore. He's talking about this is Jewish in nature. This is a promise that is given to the Jewish people. Um, he talks about these 70 weeks, or you know, there's seven days in the week. So if you take those days and multiply them by the weeks, seven times seven, you come up with 490. We know that those weeks, those units, represent years. And so he has given us a timetable for a 490 years for something to take place. Well, it's in the last part of verse 24. It says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people in your holy city. For what? What purpose? Well, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up the visions and prophecies, and to anoint the most holy place. So in this time period, some things are going to be brought to completion by God. He talks about the end of sin, the, the fulfillment of all the prophecies that have been given. He talks about the Messiah that we know as Jesus Christ will be anointed as the king. And so if, if we take these things, we're going to go ahead and put a chart up here. We're, we're, we're visual in nature. This is going to help us here. He said, remember if he says in, in, um, in verse 25, he says, So are you to know and discern 
that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem <coughs> until the Messiah, the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So, from the time that the, the you remember they're in captivity, ultimately a decree is going to go out that they can go back to Jerusalem and begin rebuilding. And that happens in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. We won't look at those verses, but, but the Ezra, you know, writes about the, uh, you know, the decree that went out that allowed them to go back. And so you take the seven sevens, and then 62 sevens, so 69 of those seven takes place until it says the anointed one will be cut off. So if you had 490 years that this is going to all happen, he says after 483 years, the anointed one, the Messiah, is going to be cut off. We know that to be the crucifixion. All right? Christ then, you know, we know that Christ was going to be crucified. Christ had to be crucified. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus had to die for our sins. So regardless of whether the Jews accepted him as their Messiah, Jesus was going to die. But had the Jews accepted him as their Messiah, had they received him the final week that we know of the tribulation that's revealed for us in, in Revelations, that final week would have begun in sequence. Christ would have been crucified, and the tribulation would have started. That's how everything would have, would have played out and gone out. But the Jews rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected their Messiah. We'll add the second part of our chart. So then from the crucifixion, God's stuck, uh, time clock working with the Jews, it stops. You know, if it's been clicking for 483 years, it has 490 years to go. It's like they just put a pause button on it. It stops. And then to the, the church age, you know, which in the Old Testament, we know looking back now, they talked about the mystery that was going to come with the Gentiles. And that's the age that we are living in right now. Well, then it says in verse 27, so you've got this church age, but in verse 27 then it says, um, and he will make a firm covenant, it's talking about Satan here, he will make a firm covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offerings, and on and on it goes. So this final week, it says, that, that ultimately um, a decree is going to be signed to allow the Jews to go back into Jerusalem and to begin their worship once again. That starts the final week, the clock ticking again. Um, and, and, and that's much of what we're going to look at here in the book of Revelations. So, you know, the, the, the church, if, if you wonder, well, how is this all going to play out? Now think about this. If the church, if all believers in Jesus Christ are suddenly raptured, I mean, if it happens this afternoon, if it happens this moment, you know, and, and believers are taken, can you imagine the worldwide devastation that's going to take place? I mean, there many books have been written about this, what it would be like, movies have been produced, and, and they're probably pretty accurate. You know, Christian pilots who are flying, gone. Nobody flying the planes anymore. Cars, gone, suddenly accidents. You know, financial devastation to the world. The stage is going to be set for someone to step forward, a one world leader that will unite the whole world. And he's going to be making compromises with all sorts of people. I mean, we have been trying to get peace in the Middle East for how many years? And this man is going to make a compromise. And he is going to sign a decree. <laughs> and he is going to allow the Jews back to start their sacrificial system once again. You know, so, so you know, you, you can just see how this plays out in the book of Revelation. So what we're going to be looking at today is the period between the rapture. The rapture doesn't start the tribulation, the signing of the decree for Israel to start their worship system and going back into Jerusalem. That is what starts it. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 of Revelation is what takes place in that time period. I don't know how long it's going to be. It could be a few days, it could be weeks, it could be a month. I am not positive of it. But John, in these two chapters, is allowed to see a scene that is going to be taking place in heaven during this time. And I'm kind of glad because when I was younger in my faith, and I read the book of Revelation, I read, you know, this scene of heaven, and it's, it's a powerful scene we're going to look at. Uh, but that was my picture of what heaven was all the time. 
And as powerful as it is, you kind of look at it, you know, he talks about those around the throne constantly, holy, holy, holy art thou, and, you know, constantly the bowing down, and you think, wow, that's great, but, you know, is that it? Is that, you know, that, that constant scene? Well, that's all going to be taking place, but, but this very specifically, what we're looking at today, is what happens between the rapture of the church and the beginning of the tribulation. You're going to see that especially played out as we get to chapter 5 here. So with that, chapter 4, which we're in today, is going to give us a beautiful picture. And I, and I know I'm going long here, but um, we're just going to be looking at a few things from chapter 4 here. Um, I'm going to have you stand, if you would. We're going to read chapter 4. I'm going to read that for you in, in uh, respect of God's word and stand. It says in verse 1, After these things, I look. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf. And the third creature had the face of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders then will fall down before him who sits on the throne, and they will worship him who lives forever and ever, and they will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they exist, and they are created. Amen and amen. You may sit down. Let's talk about this, this gorgeous, beautiful picture that we are given of the Heavenly Father. And there are a lot of symbols that, that identify characters of God the Father in, in this vision of, of heaven that he is allowed to see. Uh, first of all, he talks about in verse 2 and 3, he says he saw him on the throne and he was like a jasper stone and our, and our, our sardelia stone. Well, those are kind of foreign to us. Uh, a jasper stone... Um, it's described in chapter 21, uh, verse 11. I think we have that verse for us. It says, Having the glory of God, her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone as crystal clear as jasper is. Now, there's something unique about this because a jasper stone um, is actually a greenish type of a stone. But this stone is, is so pure in its form, it's like crystal clear, you know, like crystal. It, it talks about our, our, our Sardinia stone, which is ruby red. You know, that red, a picture of the blood, the redemptive nature of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ. There's also something else very interesting here. Um, if you look at these two stones, if you remember the high priest, they had a vest that the high priest wore. And on the high priest, there were 12 stones on that uh, uh, breast, his breast that represented each stone, represented one of the tribes of Israel. You know, kind of, we might say, you know, kind of their birthstone type of a thing. Well, the, the Jasper stone represented the tribe of Reuben. The Sardinia stone represented the tribe of Benjamin. You know, the first was Reuben, the last was Benjamin. And so you have the sense that just as Jesus Christ was there in the center of the churches in the midst of the candlesticks in chapters 1 through 3, now we have totally switched you know, economies here. And now we see God the Father and, and Israel. He is in, in, in the midst of the tribes of Israel. Um, we're also told that all around the throne, all around God, there was this rainbow. But it's a unique rainbow. It wasn't just a, a half rainbow like we see in the skies. And we certainly remember back to Noah. We're going to go ahead and skip those verses. But remember way back in Noah, you know, that when God, when they got off the ark, you know, God gave them a rainbow. He says, it's going to be a reminder of my mercy and that I'll never destroy the world again by water. He doesn't say he'll never destroy the world again. But he says he's never going to do it by flood. And it's, it's kind of like us, that rainbow is supposed to be like, you know, people used to, you know, years ago, if they had something, they really had to remember, they'd tie a string around their finger, you know, and, and, and later on in the day, you know, that, that string just reminded them of, of, of what they had to remember. And when we see that rain, we're supposed to be a reminder of God's mercy. And so you have that beautiful reminder. Now it's just, it's not a half rainbow, it's a, a full rainbow that encompasses uh, the throne. 
And then this beautiful picture of God's mercy and God's grace and his power and his majesty, lightning and peals of thunder going out from the throne. I mean, this is a, a consistent picture of God that we are given throughout the whole Bible. And I guess, you know, as we, as we look, how do we apply stuff here? I mean, okay, this is great. We see this. You know, so what? What does that mean to me today? Well, folks, do we worship our God as, you know, this description gives us? Is that how you see God? When you think about God? I mean, he's revealing to us. Revelation is something that we would not know had God not told us. And he is telling us something about his character, about his nature, about who he is. And he talks here about his holiness, about his purity, about his righteousness. He talks about that he is the God with a redemptive nature, wanting to save us and bring him to himself. Is that what we think about when we think about God the Father? This is how he wants to be seen. This is what he reveals to us. In verse 6, we're given another picture of him. I just wanted to pause there for a second. It says, And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. We see from this picture of this, this sea of glass, this crystal sea, we see that God demands a purity before him. Matter of fact, in Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on the wickedness with favor. God has no part with sin. And if you think for a moment that our sin is not any more offensive than my sin, your sin isn't any more offensive to God than, you know, as we talk about the horrible sinners, then, then we're mistaken. I mean, think about Jesus Christ as, as he hung upon the cross. Remember, there was a moment when Jesus Christ, our Savior, took our sins upon himself. And at that moment, what did he cry out? He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God the Father, in his holiness and his purity, will have nothing to do with sin. And if God the Father had nothing to do with his son at that moment when he took his sin upon him, how, how do you think he's going to deal with our sin, with you and I? Folks, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you think somehow you're going to get into heaven and God is just going to be this loving God and, oh, it's okay. God separated from his very son, the Trinity, for that moment, broke him. Do you think he's going to overlook my sin, your sin? And it's going to be that moment that, that, that we will need the blood of Jesus Christ to have cleansed us, to purify us, to be an atonement, a covering for our sin, so that when the Father looks down upon us, he does not see Larry Marble. He sees his Son, Jesus Christ. And if you've not given your life to him, if you've not asked him to be, you know, to forgive you, to be your Lord and Savior. I mean, this is, this is a scene that we're given. This is the very nature of our God. And that nature is not going to change. And our chance is now. It's here and now. It's this moment to give your life to Jesus Christ. And you say, well, okay, that's great, that's true, but how, how is this crystal sea, how is that represented, the sea of glass, how does that represent uh, the purity of God. Well, it's kind of neat some of the, the connections that we have with the, the temple and the tabernacle, you know, uh, of the old time. Many of those things were, were pictures of, of, of things in heaven. And in the Old Testament, the priests had something called a labor, which was also called the Sea of Glass. Now, a labor really was a, a large, ornate basin of water that the priests used to wash themselves before they went in to serve before God. Uh, the, the priests would be ceremoniously clean or they would not be able to enter into the holiest of holies. So this is a beautiful picture of the purity, the, the washing, the cleansing. And, and the Jews would have understood that. We understand in the New Testament that we are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are cleansed by his blood. You know, Hebrews chapter 9 tells us about the shedding of blood 
There's no remission of sin. Matthew 26, verse 28 talks about that he shed his blood for the remission of our sins. And we need to accept Christ's shed blood to be cleansed, to have our sins forgiven. It's so important. But now in the future, if, if you see this sea, there is no longer a need to be washed. It says the sea of glass is like unto crystal. In other words, it is solid. And we're not going to take the time to look at it, but if you go to Revelation chapter 15, verse 2, you're, as a matter of fact, you see the saints, it says they are standing on the sea of glass. So, so it's a picture, but, it, but it's solid. It's not used for washing. It's a symbol of purity. Instead of being washed in it, it is now before God's throne, solid, so that we are able to have direct access to God the Father. Folks, what a great God that we have. Remember, this is the almighty God that we are talking about that is telling you this today. Telling me this today about himself. And sometimes it's so easy for us to get caught up in living the Christian life. You know, and, and how it applies to my family and my kids and these decisions that I'm making. And that's all important. But sometimes we forget the awesomeness of the Heavenly Father that we have. The God whom we serve. But when this day comes in chapter 4, nobody, nobody is going to fail to recognize his beauty. All of heaven is going to be open wide for us and we are going to come to see God face to face. And we will all praise his name. All things will worship him. As a matter of fact, we kind of have a progression of, of things that break out. And begin this, this spontaneous moment of worship. Remember, this is happening in between the rapture of the church and the signing of the covenant and the beginning of the tribulation. So again, we don't know how long this takes place, but, but suddenly this, this uh, spontaneous worship service breaks out. It says in verse 4, Around the throne there were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments, and golden crowns were on their head. Uh, these are going to be the first ones we're going to see in a moment that they're going to begin worshiping. But let's answer that question. Who are these 24? Who are these 24 that are sitting on the thrones? Well, it's hard to tell exactly. Uh, we do have a few hints of who they are. Um, we're, they're said to be clothed in white raiment. Uh, that clothing is used to describe those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, we're given a white raiment, a, a covering. It talks about having crowns on their head. Um, these weren't crowns of rule. These weren't crowns of authority. The Greek word here isn't diadem, but they're crowns that were won in the arena of faith. In other words, we talked about the rewards of receiving crowns. It's the word stephanus in the Greek, and that's the word that's used here. So these are, are uh, crowns that they have for faithful service in their life. So. We could rule out something. We could rule out angels. These aren't angels that are sitting on these thrones because angels don't have to accept Christ. They're not clothed in white raiment. Angels don't receive rewards. Only Christians do. You know, that's part of, of this side of eternity. Some people uh, have said they believe it's the 12 apostles, you know, the 12 disciples, and the 12 tribes, the heads of the 12 tribes, you know, that adds up to 24. I'm not, I'm not sure. There's absolutely no other place in Scripture, but, but I could see a case being made to you know that you know, there's going to be this unity and everything of the Old Testament and New, New Testament. Um, but I think probably the most important that we think, thing we take away from here is that whoever they are, they represent the things of the earth. You know, these, these are people that were on the earth. And they have been redeemed. They've been clothed in white. And, and they have before them rewards of, of, of faithful service to their Lord. Now there's, other, there's others in this picture. It talks about a living creature. Um, in verse 6 it talks about again. It says that before the throne there was something like a sea of glass. And in the center around the throne there were four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. And then it goes on to describe them. You know, the, one was like a lion, the other was like a calf. The other had the face of a man. The other was flying like an eagle. And again, you say, well, what is this? Well, you know, again, I think this is just one of those things that we don't know. 
exactly what is taking place here. Um, it is something like nothing we know, so I would say that it's probably not of this earth, that it is probably a, a heavenly being. You know, some people have said, you know, it represents the four different Gospels. Some have said it represents the four different stages of Israel. I, I'm not sure about that. It's hard to say. Um, we, we do know that there's a description of heavenly beings that are cherubims, that are, that are angels. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 14 and 15, um, Ezekiel is allowed to see into heaven. And, and what he sees, he describes, it says, each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub, the second the face of a man, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of an eagle. Then the cherubim rose up. They are the living beings that I saw by the river of Chabar. So it's not the exact same, it's a, it's a similar description that we're given to, to this living creature that's before the throne. But I think it's safe to say that they represent all things in heaven. So you've got by the, the, the thrones, the, 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 those that are sitting around the thrones represent the things of the earth. These, these uh, holy creatures, they represent the things of the heaven. As a matter of fact, these holy creatures, they suddenly begin to worship. They start a chant, holy, 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 set apart. God is, God the Father is like nothing that, that we know. He is so different. He is almighty God. He is all ruling, they go on to describe. He is an absolute. And they are continually chanting this and recognizing and pronouncing God's position of who he is. And as those beasts are worshiping God, Suddenly it says, then the elders suddenly jump in. In verse 10, he says, the 24 hours then will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever. And they will cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, O Lord, and our God to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they exist, and they were created. So, there's a lantern to the worship. They, they, they stand up and they begin to take their crowns. Their, their godly spiritual achievements, the things they had done for Christ, they take those things, they begin to lay them at the foot of the throne of God. You know, these crowns that they, you know, diligently earned. Some, they earned the crown because they were martyred. They were killed for their faith. And they stood faithful. Others had the crown of, of evangelism, of telling people about, uh, about Jesus Christ. I don't even know. I think there's like four or five crowns that are mentioned in the Bible, and, and, and nowhere are we given an exhaustive list. There could be crowns for serving Christ faithfully. There could be crowns for, for just doing physical work in the name of Christ, that, that cup of cold water being a give, given in Jesus' name. All of these things, they, you know, I believe will, will be things for us to worship God. And folks, I don't ever want to stand before the throne empty-handed. I don't want to get into heaven by the skin of my teeth because a worship is going to break out there. And what are you going to have to lay before the throne? To, to acknowledge God's worthiness, the glory and honor, the power that is due his name. Now the one question again, you know, okay, so what does this mean to us? You know, Aside from knowing this is in the future, it's going to take place. And wow, <laughs> what does this mean to us? Well, I was looking at this past week, and you know, one question came to my mind as I look at this great scene. This great scene of praise and adoration. You know, one day we are promised we are going to have scenes like this in heaven. We're going to be part of them. And the question I ask myself is why do we wait? Why do we wait? God. The Father, described for us here, is the same God right now. However long this scene is going to be before it is played out, you know, God is that same God for us now. He is, he is holy. All glory and honor and power are deserving of Him. He is the same God today, yesterday, today, and forever, it says. And certainly He deserves my worship today. My life given to Him today. So I guess the question I'm going to leave us with, and very simply here, is what do we have to offer him in worship today? What would you offer Christ? What are you offering of your life in worship? 
Certainly, we worship by our mouths and our, our minds, our hearts, and we worship earlier, singing praise to Him. That, that's a form of worship. We can worship by telling other people about Jesus Christ, you know, witnessing, telling about a God who loves them and forgives them. We can use our hands to worship. Do you be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ to minister and to serve? Our lives, our very lives can be an example of what it means to be a child of God. And then that's an act of worship. So what is it today that you would have to offer the Almighty God? Now I know we're, we're kind of over today. I'm going to ask you, we're going to close here. I'm going to ask you to stand and pray. I'm going to give us, we're not going to have a closing song. We're just going to pray and dismiss here. But I'm going to give you a few moments to, to just ask yourself that question. Answer that question. What is it that you are, 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 are doing right now, building part of in your faith that you believe that you could lay at the throne of God to give to him? Let's just quietly pray and then I'll close us in prayer. Father God, we never even touched on the wonder that you would even care about our worship. That you find joy in it. That when I am, when we are the hands and feet of Christ, that that's an offering to you. When I am your voice, that's an offering to you. When I am a, that living example that I do that for you. I can't believe that, that, that you would accept this from us, that this is so pleasing to you. I don't understand it. But Father, Father, I accept it. You say it all through your word. And so I pray for myself as I pray for my brothers and sisters here. You know, if we've gotten bogged down in this life, Lord, and, you know, it's easy to get off track in the areas of our service and our hearts, our attitudes, our lives. Call us back to you. Remind us this week, not just this morning, remind us this week to serve you, to worship you. And Lord, I pray for any here who do not know you as their Lord and Savior, that right now you're just stirring in their heart. Father, if there are any that are ready to receive you, I pray that they will come after the service and talk to me and sit down. Or talk to one of our ladies, Lord share Jesus Christ with them and his forgiveness. Father, don't, don't let any of us go away from your heaven not having done business with you. You've given us this moment to search our hearts. And now let us go forth, Father, to make the changes you have pointed out to us. Once again, as we look at this scene, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, your power, your might, your holiness on display today and one day in eternity. And it's in the name of Almighty God's name of His Son, Jesus Christ, we have gathered together, Lord. And in His name we pray these things. Amen. You are dismissed then. Thank you. Thank you.